as you probably know in the history of Western science, which let's say began with Galileo, it's a pretty good starting point. Uh, it was 300 years before the scientific study of the mind even began. It was widely, widely assumed, going way back to, to Thales and the early you know, Ionian thinkers in Greece, that they could study the objective universe and just leave out the mind as if it was not, had no significance, had no impact, was irrelevant. And when I studied cosmology, among many, many other branches of physics, when I was at Amherst College, I read one cosmology text after another, and I found they all had something in common, many things in common, of course, but one of them was they made no references to consciousness, no references to the mind. And this is quite endemic for Western Eurocentric civilization altogether. You notice that we have Nobel, Nobel Prizes in a wide variety of branches of science, physics, chemistry, and so forth. Um, have you noticed that there's no Nobel Prize given for psychology? When I was an undergrad in psychology, um, Daniel Kahneman had won the Nobel Prize for his work, and the lecture we were told about that, that we were told his Nobel Prize was economics, because it was kind of behavioral economics, right. even though he was a psychologist, right? So yeah, yeah, you're very right. You have to you'll either be like Pavlov, it'll either, either be in biology or in economics. The human mind, there's nothing in nature more important than mind, or that's human species anyway. And yet, it's not significant enough to have a Nobel Prize for it. And so, the mind has been marginalized in Western science since Galileo, right up to the rise of modern psychology. It had about a 35 year breathing spell of actually looking at the mind, and then they shut that down. And it's been almost entirely supplanted by behaviorism, neuroscience, and cognitive psychology, but, but which is all looking outwards. And so when you go to Tibet and its culture, its Buddhist culture that goes back about 1200 years, rooted in another 1200 years or so of Indian Buddhist culture, and again, the first universities in the world were not by the Muslims. It was not the University of Bologna or Sorbonne or Oxford or Cambridge. Centuries and centuries before, many centuries before, there were already great universities. Takashila, which is the time of the Buddha, and Nalanda, it arose, arose and was on a decline before any of the Western universities ever even came into existence. And these were universities. But the difference between these, these multiple universities in Indian culture, classical Indian culture, was for all of them, the central topic of study was the mind. It was called Adhyatma Vidya, the knowledge of the inner world, the inner knowledge of the mind. And of course, India, like China, like Europe, like South America, they had, statistically speaking, they had to have their fair share of geniuses. Genius was not all European, despite many European histories that would suggest, yeah, we got all of them. And the rest of people are you know, savages and uncivilized. And so if we simply consider the biological fact that 5,000 years of civilization in India produced a corresponding number of geniuses as Europe, which doesn't have a 5,000 year history of civilization much shorter than that, they've made many, many discoveries that have been replicated and for which there are manifest benefits and they have to do with multiple dimensions of the mind. And so modern psychology really doesn't go any further than the subconscious or some people take seriously and many do not Jung's collective unconscious, but it's hard to test scientifically. It's more like, you know, speculation, true or not. It doesn't have empirical evidence, com compelling empir empirical evidence behind it. And so I, I have never really given up my passion for science, for empiricism, for having hypotheses you can put to the test with experience and either confirm them or, you know, throw out the garbage. And so the, the short answer to your question after a long prelude is to my mind, there's just no doubt, starting with the Buddha himself, but not starting with him. Centuries before them, these great Indian yogis, swamis, rishis, and so forth, had already turned into a fine art, or one could say a fine technology, the development of samadhi. Not the Chinese, not the Hebrews, not the Greeks or Romans, not the Mayans. The development of highly refined, highly focused, high energy, flow of consciousness, of meditative concentration, India gets the kudos for that. They developed it, it spread to China, to Tibet, Southeast Asia, and so forth. Whereas we in the West, we're, trying, we're still start struggling with ADHD. You know, and we're treating it with Adderall and Ritalin. We're treating it, you know, instead of actually getting to the underlying causes of attention deficit, I have an hyperactivity disorder. Like every other psychological disorder when put into the hands of the pharmaceutical industry, we're just suppressing the symptoms. With the full support of the scientific community, the whole field is anesthesiology. 
why in America it's called the National Institute of Mental Health, it should be called the National Institute of Mental Anesthesiology because almost all the funding goes to drugs and there's not even one that cures a single mental disease, they only suppress symptoms, which means they're treating, treating the symptoms and not getting to the root cause. Whereas the Buddha himself, he didn't start out to start a religion because that word didn't even exist in Sanskrit. He had his awakening and then he, first thing he addressed was not a leap of faith, believe in me, I'm omniscient or believe in God or karma, but just here's the reality of suffering. And then when he turned to the root of suffering, he didn't go metaphysical or transcendent or spiritual or anything like that. He said the roots of suffering are phenomena within the natural world and we can explore them. <coughs> and then in terms of finding such liberation from suffering, setting out on the path, that's where samadhi really comes into play. Because prior to the Buddha, prior to 2,600 years ago, samadhi developing these extremely subtle, profound, abstracted states of consciousness in which your, your awareness is completely removed from the physical world, your body, your, your human mind, it was taken as an end in itself, as kind of a moksha or liberation by escaping from reality or escaping to a subtler reality. And Gautama, as a young prince at the age of 35, being the prodigy that he was, he's, he's famous for very good reason, uh, he achieved those same states of samadhi and he, he had the perspicacity to recognize, yeah, this is a great vacation from this world here, but it doesn't actually get to the root of anything. And so he took samadhi, or you use the term shamatha, methods of great attentional refinement, and then combined these with inquiry, contemplative inquiry, rigorous, rational, empirical, and discovered that there are multiple dimensions of consciousness. And the most superficial is the whole range of mental phenomena that clearly do arise independent upon the body. I'm using my words carefully here. Is there any brain science in Buddhism? No, and I don't think there's any brain science in any of the great religious or contemplative traditions of the world. So good credit where credit is due. If you want to know about the brain, don't ask Buddhists, unless they happen to be, happen to be Buddhist neuroscientists. And so tremendous advantages over the last 50 years or so in studying the brain and understanding the neurocorrelates to a wide and increasingly wide range of mental processes, states of consciousness and so forth. Uh, interesting work being done in psychedelics. How does that influence consciousness? So that's good. But in terms of actually fathoming the nature of consciousness, we go back the old fashioned way and that is observe it with all the precision, the acuity, the rigor you possibly can. And so what's been discovered here, and I will offer this not as religious propositions or as philosophical speculations, assertions that have been tested, can be tested, should be tested in full collaboration with the scientific community, people like yourself. And that is beyond the bandwidth, so to speak, of the human mind where emotions, thoughts, desires, perceptions, memories, and so forth do arise clearly, and I will say in the 21st century, independence upon very specific neural correlates about which you get no information from Buddhism, but they did, Buddhists have always accepted from the time of the Buddha that this human mind arises independence upon the body, injure the body, damage the body, let the body be ill or the, or the body or the brain suffer from senile, senile dementia or Alzheimer's, which have been around for a long time, or brain injury, uh, and your mind will suffer. And you can actually shut it down. The more you damage the brain, the more the mind shuts down. So that's all good science, and it's also been affirmed by Buddhists from the beginning. But then we can ask a question for which there's no scientific answer. The question, yeah, but no answer. What are the, cause and, what are the natural causes and conditions they give rise to the emergence of consciousness, being aware, experiencing in a human fetus. They've studied very carefully, with great insight, the formation of the nervous system, the brain, the formation of the, the visual cortex, the, the auditory cortex, and so forth. It's great science. But they don't have an exploration. How did the brain ever become conscious? How did human beings ever become conscious? Frankly, they don't have a clue. They, don't, they can't measure it. They can't define it. They don't know where it comes from. And so therefore, the notion that, well, of course, scientifically, we know that when you die, your consciousness just becomes non-existent. That's often touted as scientific truth, an unquestioned scientific truth. And all that is, is an expression of uncritical faith, blind faith in materialism. Because if you don't know what causes consciousness, you don't have a clue what brings it, brings it to an end. It's just belief akin to religious belief, which is already fine, but it should never be touted as science. So... Buddhist approach here, rooted in the maybe 2,000 years or so 
of contemplative research in samadhi prior to the Buddha. Yogis who spend 12, 14, 16 hours a day, and I've trained under some people of that, of that caliber, meditating for years and years and years that puts you know, full-time uh, uh, astronomers to shame. Like, boy, you're, you're such slackers. You only work 12, 14 hours a day. These yogis, 16 hours a day for years on end, have penetrated through the bandwidth, the spectrum of subjective experience that clearly does arise independence upon the brain. It's influenced by the brain, but reciprocally, very, very importantly, influences the brain, the placebo effect, and so many other aspects of our emotions, our thoughts, desires, and so forth, have a clear, measurable, biological impact on the brain, the immune system, the heart, and so forth. It's a scientific fact that the causality is two-way. The, the mind is not just what the brain does. There's causality and it's interactive. But cutting through that and asking, from what did the human mind emerge? Because I'm 70, so my mind, Alan Wallace's mind, didn't exist 72 years ago. Not anywhere in the universe. It did not exist. Because it arose independence upon the brain that formed, you know, when my body was still a fetus. And then what happens to consciousness? What actually does happen? Something is true. Happens at death. And to simply believe that you'll go to heaven or hell, or you'll, you'll be reborn, or that you become you know, a non-entity, that's all very well. But that's just belief is cheap. Belief is cheap. Anybody can believe anything, and pretty, pretty much people do. But to actually have knowledge, that's much, much harder. And the key here is not studying more about the brain, because the brain will only tell you about subjective experience correlated to the brain. But when the brain shuts down, it goes dead. Story is over. The brain scientist is now out of work. Because now you're looking at fertilizers. If you want to become a fertilizer scientist, you can shift job from a brain scientist to a fertilizer scientist. You can tell us a lot about the fertilizer that the brain becomes but you'll learn nothing about consciousness. And so the discovery that's been made, replicated countless times, but never fully in collaboration with scientists, open-minded but very rigorous and skeptical scientists, is does the human mind at death simply go into nothing or does it dissolve back into, melt into a more primal flow of consciousness? And likewise, the emergence of the human mind sometime after conception, and I, I don't pretend to know when, but clearly, not before conception, maybe at conception, like Roman Catholics believe that's when the soul is a human soul, as soon as the, the, the egg is fertilized. But to replace belief and conjecture and religious faith and philosophical speculation with actual knowledge, well, this is what contemplatives have done. And they found that there is an underlying continuum of consciousness that is individuated, it's not a collective unconscious, and it is a repository of our memories and our habitual propensities, character traits and so forth, carried on from the past that will carry on to the future. That will first, first glance, of course, like, oh, well, you're a Buddhist, that's what you have to say. You believe in Buddhism, that you have to believe that. I don't have to believe in anything. I really don't have to believe in anything. There's no evidence, why should I believe it? And I wasn't born as a Buddhist. I've come to this conclusion with a scientifically trained mind, you know? And I was planning to be a scientist from the time I was 13. So that way of thinking is not alien to me. This is a testable hypothesis. And I think I know, I'm familiar with all of the materialistic hypotheses about the nature of consciousness, including that of my colleague, and I would say my friend, Christoph Koch, and I believe you, you've interviewed him. Mm -hmm. And I know his work of his, his colleague, Giulio Dononi, and I respect uh, Christoph very much. We, had a, we have had an 11 hour conversation years ago, about 10 years ago, when he invited me to Caltech. Straight, we talked right through lunch. And I found him warm, warm hearted and open, and critical. He has his own beliefs, which are very different from mine, but we had a, a meaningful and fruitful conversation. But even this, I think, maybe the most sophisticated, materialistic understanding of consciousness starts with a leap of faith. And that all you have to do is assert that if you have a, a physical system with integrated information, that corresponds to the amount of consciousness in that system. If you believe that, then you can, then you can roll the machine and you can get all kinds of conclusions. Where's the evidence? Where's the evidence? that a system that has integrated information somehow is therefore conscious? And the answer is, there isn't any. But if you make that leap of faith, then you can be an advocate of integrated information theory. Yeah. But I've just never been good at leaps of faith. And so in the Buddhist inquiry, you don't have to make any leap of faith. You have to have an open mind and then investigate for yourself. It comes down to a very simple empirical question. That is, you'll know as a neuroscientist. You are a neuroscientist, I'm correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll make sure. Uh, how many times have you heard this? Memories are encoded in the brain. Yeah, that's definitely that uh, seen as a, as a truth in neuroscience. 
unquestioned or un unquestioned truth. And there is evidence behind that. And that is if you stimulate certain ganglia of neurons and memory may pop up, damage or eradicate, you know, excise a ganglia of neurons, you may lose a memory. You may get it back due to neuroplasticity, but clearly there are correlations between specific configurations of neurons, synapses, and specific memory. That's good science. That's very good science. Now, what exactly does a memory, when you have a memory of your mother's face, the memory of your mother, mother's face, I mean, the color of her hair, her complexion, um, her eyes, and so forth, clearly that Im the imagery that comes to mind when you, th when you think of your mother's face, that imagery, the mental images, are not physical. They can't be measured physically. They have no physical attributes. They're not located in physical space. They're not physical. So what on earth does this actually mean to say that something non-physical is encoded in something physical? Is E equals MC squared, was that encoded in some part of Einstein's brain? And his differential equations for general relativity were actually located in some, in some, kind of his, in some part of his brain? It's a categorical error. But it's a reasonable hypothesis because of the correlations. And so there's a hypothesis. It's not, how do you say, conclusive evidence, but it's reasonable. And the Buddha said, yeah, that's, that's reasonable, except you've got a categorical error. How do you encode something non-physical and something physical? That doesn't really make any sense. And in laws of physics, which I have studied, there's no branch of physics that allows for non-physical phenomena, like the mental image of your mother's face, to emerge from physical phenomena. Physical phenomena of all kinds have emergent properties, but all the emergent properties of physical phenomena are emergent properties. They don't give rise to non-physics. That would go into pseudo-physics or science fiction, but the area of your mother's face or your memories are not physical. So then we can ask, if they're not encoded in the brain, if they're not stored in the brain, actually located in the physical space of your brain, then where are they located? And the Buddhist answer is, they're located in this primal flow, this primal flow of consciousness that carries on from lifetime to lifetime. And a way to test that is to go into deep samadhi, specifically achieve shamatha, go into this, let your mind, your human mind, dissolve into this underlying, very clear, cognizant, luminous flow of consciousness called the substrate consciousness, and go there. And once you have, and it, takes, it can take months or years of very rigorous training, very demanding, to, in which your physical senses entirely implode, your mind totally calms down, but you go into a deeper, deeper, sharper and sharper state of clarity, luminosity, brightness, and acuity of awareness. So it's nothing like a trance. And you can't get this with drugs, LSD, you name it. It will not give rise to this. There's no, there's no shortcut or cheap trick like taking a drug that can you bring into a very, very deep state of samadhi. It's technology. It's a contemplative technology. And once you are there, and this has been done many, many times, now you are in the actual hard drive of the mind. The brain is like a keyboard, but the hard drive of the mind is the subject consciousness. Buddhist hypothesis, let's just treat it as hypothesis, not a philosophical conjecture or religious belief, all you have to believe because Buddha says so. Nonsense. If memories are stored there, not in the brain, but if you damage your keyboard enough, you'll, you'll, you'll lose memory, you'll, you'll not have access to a lot of your memories, right? The hard drive is still intact. If you damage your keyboard, pour coffee all over it, then you, you, know, you may not have access to your software. You have, may a lot of, lose, lose a lot of That is, you can't see them appear on the screen. They won't manifest in behavior. And behavior is the screen. Brain is, hard, brain is the keyboard, the substrate consciousness, hard drive. And so if memories are in fact not stored in the brain or encoded in the brain, but are correlated with very specific neuronal activities and functions, places in the brain, then a way of testing that would be to go into this profound state of samadhi and see if you can retrieve, first of all, kind of like a, 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 a preparation. See if you can retrieve memories from a very early childhood. So if you're 40, for example, can you retrieve a memory you couldn't possibly recall in your normal waking state? Like, what did you have for breakfast this day 20 years ago? I think the chances are zero, right? Unless you have the same breakfast every day. And so this has been done. See if you can retrieve memories when you're in this deep state of samadhi that you cannot possibly retrieve in the ordinary waking state. And if it turns out that you can, and they've been doing this for at least 1,500 or 2,000 years in Buddhist tradition, then see, so I'm just gonna, not, I'm just gonna say, let's imagine you're 40. All right, what do you recall on this day, September 14, 
42 years ago. And of course, if you ran this experiment, you might come up, you go to deep samadhi, you come out, I'm the scientist and say, James, what do you recall from 42 years ago, this day? And you come up and say, I got no data. I got nothing. I got a blank screen. And that's very possible. In which case, check one up for the materials. They may be right. On the other hand, you, become, you could go into that samadhi and come out and you could say something silly. Like, I was Cleopatra. Like, I'm just giving you something that can't possibly be true, right? But we know memory can be very creative. And we can remember all kinds of things that never happened. And we forget most of the things that do happen. So you could come up with something that's complete fiction. No doubt about that. And it might even sound plausible, but it can feel complete fiction. But it's also possible you might go in, focus the laser pointer of your samadhi on this day 42 years ago, and have memories come up, and you report them. And what if they're veridical? What if they can be tested? That you were an old man, 42 years old, who lived in Copenhagen, and your wife died three years ago, and you tell the address and who your daughter is, and she takes care of you. What was your job? Who are your colleagues? And what if it turns out to be all true? The scientist, an open-minded scientist, would be interesting, but maybe this is a scam. Maybe this, you, you poor Buddhists are trying to prove yourself right and you're trying to trick us. And then the scientists would come in. If this were done in a scientific context, okay, you came up with a lot of true answers, but this could be all a scam to try to you know, trick us here. So the scientists would go back and they would do their own background research on this individual who did exist. And they would ask relatives and friends and employees and colleagues and so forth. And they would come up with a ton of information about this man and his childhood and so forth. And they'd come back and say, okay, Mr. Yogi James, good start. But if this is a conspiracy, if you're trying to fool us here, answer this question. How many stones were there are? How many stones were there on the wedding ring, wedding ring you gave to your wife? How many, how many stones were there? Where do you buy it? If this is a can, you can't prepare for every possible question. No way. And so this is actually a testable hypothesis. When I've looked at all the other materialistic hypotheses, from the information, integrated information theory, the mind is the brain, the mind is a function of the brain, the mind is an immersion property of the brain, and so on. What I found is not a single one is actually empirically tested. They all start with the leap of faith that you can't test. So I find here the materialists look like more true religious believers, and the really open-minded, rigorous, contemplative looks like the real scientist on the block. So what I'm looking forward to is and we're doing this now, we're, we're just beginning in Crestone, Colorado, in the United States. We have now created and we're developing a center for contemplative research, which is precisely designed to bring to mind open-minded, professionally trained contemplatives with open mind, professionally trained scientists and say, look, you brain scientists, psychologists, you know a lot that we don't know. And the physicists, you know a lot that we don't know. But we, allegedly, we know a lot about consciousness that you don't know. So let's see if we can learn from each other and not have Buddhists win or the materialists win, let everybody win, who's really keen on understanding what is the truth of the nature, the origins, the multiple dimensions of the mind. And now I'll say very, very briefly, you used a Tibetan term, rikpa. And this is, according to many, many contemplatives in the Buddhist tradition, and I think elsewhere, this is the deepest dimension of consciousness, the deepest dimension, that is beyond any individuated stream of consciousness from lifetime to lifetime. It is a dimension truly trans every conceptual construct. It's atemporal and non-local, but it is knowable. It is knowable. And there are methods, and I've been teaching them for about 30 years by now, and, and studying and practicing them for oh, longer than that, to actually realize this deepest dimension of consciousness, known by many names. And I don't think Buddhists have a monopoly on this. I think this has been accessed by great Christian contemplatives and Sufis and so forth, but that too, is a, an empirical claim, not just, oh, it must be true, Alan Wallace said so. I hope nobody thinks that, uh, so testable. So rather long, long, uh, long answer, but to a very, very important question. And I'm yeah, just eager great. to see rigorous contemplatives and scientists coming together to learn from each other. So we move beyond the, the phase thus far of scientists coming in and studying the brains and behaviors of meditators and the scientists publish all the results and they get all the credits and the meditators and never even learn what they, who they are. That's not a collaboration any more than a guinea pig collaborates with a biologist when you know, a study is done of guinea pigs. 